Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to this very unusual lunchtime seminar. I appreciate this is not our usual circumstances which means quite importantly that I was not able to bribe you here with food. So if you are listening then thank you very much for joining me today. Before I begin I would like to briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Emma and I am a trainee solicitor within the Specialist Survivors team here at Thompson's. Today's seminar is a brief overview of the development of vicarious liability. This is a particular area of law that features heavily in our day-to-day -day work as a department, but I'm sure it will be a feature for many others as well. This seminar will provide an overview of the important cases to reference for vicarious liability, along with a brief discussion on the significant Supreme Court decisions which have come out earlier this year. So, without any further ado, let's get started. So before delving any deeper into the case law, and for the benefit of all of those listening, I'd like to provide a quick refresher on what vicarious liability is. So, vicarious liability, in its simplest form, is the liability of a party for the actions or the omissions of another party. In personal injury cases, it is commonly seen in cases where an employer is held vicariously liable for an employee who has been negligent, and as a result of that negligence, someone has been injured or harmed in some way. As the case law has developed over the years, this basic principle has been extended to include a variety of situations where it can now apply. But in bringing it back to this simple definition, one of the key cases is Bell against Blackwood Monter and Sons Limited. This case held that the employer will be liable for the conduct of his or her employee at the relevant place of employment during the hours on which they are employed. An employer will be held liable if an employee is negligent in carrying out their job. This case formed the three principles of determining where there is a vicarious liability case. And as we can see from the diagram on the screen in front of us, has a harm been caused? Was the harm caused by an employee? Was the employee acting within the scope of their employment? On the screen now, I've also referenced two other cases. Story against Ashton, as you can see, is a very old case, but it refers to one of the circumstances where vicarious liability would apply. And that is where the employee has gone on a frolic of their own and is no longer acting within the scope of their employment. Mattis against Pollock is again another keen example of vicarious liability where the employee was acting to further the course of his employer's business. From this very simple example, the case law has also been extended in order to include what we now know as the close connection test. Gradually, the law has developed to include situations where the employee is carrying out actions that are out with their job role, but there is a sufficiently close connection to hold the employers vicarious liable for those actions. The leading case for this point remains as Lister against Hesley Hall Limited. It's important to understand the facts of this case, so I'll provide a brief overview. In this case, a warden was employed at an annex of a boarding school for boys, and this warden was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the school. The discipline of the boys, the organisation of their daily activities, as well as the supervision and care of the boys in after-school hours. Between 1979 and 1982, the warden was sexually abusing a number of the boys. His employers, the school, were not aware of this. The sexual abuse took numerous forms and was usually administered in the context of the warden's control and discipline at the boarding school. The question arose as to whether the employers could be held liable for the actions of an individual that was quite clearly not acting within the scope of his employment. 
the House of Lords held that vicarious liability can arise for unauthorised intentional wrongdoings committed by an employee acting for his own benefit, insofar as there exists a connection between the wrongdoings and the work for which he's employed to render it within the scope of that employment. The court held that there was a sufficient connection between the work carried out of the warden and what he was employed to do, as well as the abuse that he committed to render it within the scope. The abuse was committed at the time, premises, and during the course of the warden's care of the boys. This was sufficient enough to hold the school vicariously liable. In 2012, the law was further extended to move beyond the standard employer-employee relationship to consider relationships that are instead akin to employment. This key decision came from various claimants against the Catholic Child Welfare Society. The test will be referred to again and again throughout this presentation, but it will herewith be referred to as the Phillips test. In this case, the defender was an unincorporated organisation. The claimants were former pupils of the school that had been abused whilst attending the residential school. The brothers that taught at the school were not contractually employed by the defendant. Instead, they were religious figures. So the question that arose in this case was, could you hold a religious organisation vicariously liable for the actions of those who worked within it. The Supreme Court asked two questions in order to come to their decision. The first question was whether the relationship between the brothers within the school was one that was akin to employment. The answer to this question was quite simply, yes, it was. The second question was whether there was a sufficiently close connection between the role of the brothers and the defender themselves. It was held that because the boys lived within the school, they were vulnerable to the actions of the brothers. It didn't matter that the actions went against the objectives of the religious organisation. In this case, they were able to hold in this case, the Catholic Child Welfare Society by case the libel for the actions of the brothers, as it was held that this relationship was one that was akin to employment. The principle of vicarious liability was once again extended to include actions that could be considered illegal. In his judgment, Lord Phillips advises and makes comment that he would now consider that unincorporated associations might now be liable such liability should be extended beyond the strict extent of the employee's duties to include illegal activity and such liability should be shared. In this case, Lord Phillips sets out a five stage principle test that judges should look to when making a decision on whether an unincorporated organisation and cases where relationships that are akin to employment could be held by case with libel. I have referenced those five points on the screen for you now, and these will be referenced again as we carry on through our presentation. The Supreme Court also made note that though in this case it had applied to a case of abuse, these tests should not be confined to these special category cases. There is no need for the defendant to be carrying out activities of a commercial nature in order to meet the requirements for this test. This point was further developed and progressed in 2016 as a result of two key UK Supreme Court judgments. The first of those cases was Cox against the Ministry of Justice. In this case, the pursuer was working in a prison kitchen with a catering assistant and 20 prisoners under her direction. During the course of this work, a prisoner fell and dropped a sack of kitchen supplies on her, resulting in her injury. It is accepted in this case that the prisoner was negligent. Therefore, 
the question before the court was quite a straightforward one. Whether the prison service was vicariously liable for the acts of a prisoner in the course of his work in a prison kitchen. The case principally concerned the first element of the test for vicarious liability set out in our previous case. Whether the relationship between the individual that had caused the injury and the defendant was one that the defendant could be made vicariously liable for these actions. The case was taken to the Supreme Court where it was held that there are now three factors to be considered in holding employers accountable. I would like to note at this stage that it didn't reduce the test down from five to three, but rather the boards wanted to make a comment that they considered that three of the principles held more weight than the other two. The first point they wanted to consider was the negligent action had been considered at committed as a result of the activity carried out on behalf of the defendant. Two, the negligent party is likely to be part of the business of the activity of the defendant. And three, the defender is the one that created the risk, e.g. the environment that they were working in. And applying this back to Cox, we are able to see that the prisoners were working as part of the needed business activity of prison. They were integral to the operation of the prison. The prisoner was in a situation where he could perform a negligent act and the defender was the one that had created this risk. In this case, it was held that the defenders were liable for the negligent act of the prisoner. Similarly, in Mohammed against WM Morrison Supermarkets PLC, there was a further simplification of this test and a further understanding of what it meant. For the facts of this case, M had used a petrol station kiosk and approached the member of staff with a question. The employee of the kiosk responded in an aggressive manner and demanded that M leave immediately. As M goes to leave, the employee insults him. M brings an action against the supermarket, claiming that it is vicariously liable for the assault committed by one of its employees. In this case, the court also turned to ask another question. And it raised the question of whether a reasonable observer would consider the employee to be acting as a representative of their employer. It was held that there needed to be consideration of the employee's function and whether there was a sufficiently close connection between the wrongful conduct and the employer themselves. It was on this basis that the court held that it was a gross abuse of the employee's position and he was acting in connection with the business in which he was employed. In this case, the supermarket were held by Keres liable for the actions of their employee. Over the last few years, there has been a number of recent judgments that have brought further expansion of this five-stage test. And these are the such cases that I'll now move on to talk about. In the case of Grubb against Shannon, this is a case from Sheriff Reed sitting in the Glasgow Sheriff Court. It had the decision that was issued follows the recent Supreme Court authority, which extends the scope of vicarious liability in England and Wales. Sheriff Reid, in his judgment, quite famously comments that the facts of this case are quite uninteresting, but the law that comes out of it is. So please bear with me as I go through the quite complicated facts of this case. But for the benefit, I will first explain who each of the parties are. In this case, we have Roseanne Higgins. She is a self-employed beautician. She worked within the salon of Miss Shannon, who is the salon owner. Miss Grubb is the injured party. In a brief summary of the facts of this case, Miss Grubb had been treated by Roseanne Higgins, but seeks to recover damages from Miss Shannon as the salon owner. Miss Grubb, had been treated in the premises which were leased by Miss Shannon 
and this business operated under the training name of Blush Hair and Beauty. Miss Shannon had furnished and decorated the salon and had opened a business on Facebook under the name of Blush Hair and Beauty. When the injury was caused to Miss Grubb, Miss Shannon was not working at the salon. In fact, during this time, she was on maternity leave. Miss Shannon had selected and permitted three people to work in her salon while she was on maternity leave. Miss Higgins was one of these three people, but she was not employed by Miss Shannon. The defender permitted Miss Higgins to provide a wide range of beauty treatments to customers. Miss Higgins kept all of the income from the treatments, but paid Miss Shannon a flat rate of £20 for each day that she worked in the, the salon. It's quite an important comment to see that those that are self-employed or independent contractors wouldn't normally be held vicariously liable. But the circumstances of this case beg to differ. Sheriff Reid found that Miss Higgins had been negligent and had caused the injury. He also found that Miss Higgins could be considered self-employed. However, significantly, he also found that she carried out activities assigned to her by Miss Shannon and she was an integral part of Miss Shannon's business. She was acting for Miss Shannon's benefit and subject to Miss Shannon's control. She was not operating as an independent business recognised in her own right. The Sheriff held that Miss Higgins' negligence was a risk created by Miss Shannon in assigning those activities to Miss Higgins. The relationship was akin to that of employment. And it was therefore fair, just and reasonable to impose vicarious liability on Miss Shannon. It was held that it was important to consider what would have been apparent to a member of the public walking into that salon, rather than what had been agreed between Miss Shannon and Miss Higgins. Miss Shannon significantly obtained a real benefit from Miss Higgins operating in that salon. She received rent, the business kept trading and they also had the benefit of the goodwill attached to the name of the business. Crucially, the services provided by Miss Higgins were an integral part of Miss Shannon's business and she was not merely operating as an accessory to the salon. There was therefore sufficiently a close connection to establish vicarious liability in this case. A decision that had not ever been held before. Okay. The next case that I'm going to move on to talk about is a judgment that came out earlier this year. It was a crucial decision that was held heard in the Supreme Court and the case is Barclays Bank PLC against various claimants. There are two important cases that were heard for this case so I'm going to reference both the Court of Appeal decision and the decision that was ultimately heard from the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court decision, they reversed the decision in the Court of Appeal to reinforce the ability of companies to use the independent contractor defence when faced with claims in respect of third parties. But before going into the two separate decisions, I will give a brief summary of the facts of this case. In this case, a doctor, Dr Bates, was hired by Barclays Bank as one of a number of practitioners contracted to conduct medical examinations of both applicants to new jobs and existing members of staff. It was during these medical examinations that he assaulted 126 claimants over a long period of time. The pursuer satisfies the court to extend limitation. The question remained, if it was reasonable to attach vicarious liability to Barclays Bank. As I previously noted, the independent contractor defence is one example of where vicarious liability cannot be applied. But this case goes on to demonstrate where the boundaries of those lines can be crossed. At the Court of Appeal, 
They upheld the High Court's decision to hold the bank vicarious liable. It rejected the argument that employers should not be vicariously liable for actions of independent contractors, despite noting that it would make it easier for the conduct of the, the business and for their insurers. The court confirmed that the question involved a two-stage test. The first question asked, is the relationship one of employment or at least akin to employment? And two, if so, was the harm sufficiently closely connected with that employment or at least quasi-employment? The court went into detail of the five-stage Lord Phillips test, applying each of the different factors to the case at hand. At point one, the bank or insurers were more likely to have the means to compensate the victims and could be expected to have insured against that liability. However, the court stated that this part of the criteria carries a little weight and liability cannot be found on this point alone. At point two, whilst of some benefit to the prospective employees, it was clear beyond doubt that the principal benefit of the medical examinations was to the bank. Three, the process was part of the bank's business activity. Indeed, they commented that there couldn't have been a clearer example of this. At four, whilst the variety of facts and negligence cases are legion, in this particular case, the risk of the harm had arisen from the actions of the bank. These actions did not need to amount to negligence for this part of the criteria to be met. And five, most crucially of all, Dr Bates was greater or lesser degree under the control of the bank. When reviewed in the context of the relevant activity, medical examinations, assessments and reports, the bank had exercised sufficient to control to fulfil this criteria as well. In regards to stage two of the test, the Court of Appeal agreed with the lower court's findings that the medical examinations were sufficiently closely related to the relationship between the bank and Dr Bates. In fact, they noted this was the whole purpose of that relationship. At Court of Appeal, Barclays Bank was held vicariously liable for the actions of Dr Bates. It is also noted that both sides positively benefited from this relationship which was considered a very significant element in making the decision. The decision was ultimately appealed to the Supreme Court. At Supreme Court, the court subsequently allowed Barclays' appeal and held that the bank was not by case liable for the wrongdoings of Dr Bates. The key question was whether Dr Bates was acting as an independent contractor carrying on business of his own or if he was in a relationship akin to employment. Lady Hale confirmed that the five relevant criteria in the Phillips test might be helpful in establishing whether workers who are technically self-employed or agency are part of the employer's business. But she also noted that it is crucial to consider the underlying details of that relationship and the reason as to why that relationship exists. And turning this to the facts of this case, Lady Hale said that it was clear that although Dr Bates was a part-time employee of the health service, he was not at any time an employee of the bank, nor viewed objectively, was he anything close to an employee. She cited the example of other independent contractors, including that of window cleaners and auditors. It was admitted that the situation might be slightly different where contractors are paid a retainer of some kind and have to accept re referrals. In this case, Dr Bates was free to refuse examinations and even, no doubt, carried his own medical liability insurance. Dr Bates also had clients of his own and had a business of his own. 
it was seen that there was not a sufficiently close connection and Dr Bates could only be considered as an independent contractor in this case. The matter provides some useful guidance on the issue of vicarious liability. Although the medical consul consultant's relationship with Barclays was not found to be sufficiently close, the Barclays decision confirms that the facts of a case could override any express agreement between the parties. If the relationship between those parties is one that could be quite clearly be seen to have a relationship that is closely connected. So bringing it back to cases for the future, what we're able to see that is whilst this case does not amount to vicarious liability, the courts were not ruling out that vicarious liability could be applied in other circumstances. What they're saying is you need to be able to prove that there is a sufficiently close connection to make it that so that it is fair, just and reasonable to impose vicarious liability. It is clear that the courts are keen to look at the facts and circumstances of each case before making a decision. There is therefore no blanket ban on what my case liabilities could be. The last case that I'll be discussing as part of this seminar is one of WM Morrison Supermarkets against various claimants. This decision was released in April and is considered to be a landmark case. It involves the question of liability, along with that of the duties imposed by the Data Protection Act 1998. This case is quite complicated, so for the benefit of that, I will explain a bit further the facts of the case. The appellant in this case operated a chain of supermarkets and employed AS on its internal audit team. In July 2013, AES received a verbal warning for a minor misconduct. In November 2013, he was transmitting payroll for the entire workforce, but as he did this, he kept a personal copy of the payroll for himself. In 2014, he uploaded this information to a file sharing website. AES later sent the file anonymously to a UK newspaper pretending to be no other than a concerned anonymous bystander about the breach. As you can imagine, the newspapers did not publish this information. Instead, they alerted WM, which took immediate steps to remove the data from the internet and to protect its employees. This included alerting the police. AES was arrested and has since been prosecuted and imprisoned for these actions. The respondents were some of the affected employees, brought proceedings against the appellant personally on the basis that they were vicariously liable for AES's actions. Their claims were for a breach of statutory duty under the 1998 Act, misuse of private information and breach of confidence. At trial, the judge concluded that the appellant bore no primary responsibility, but was vicariously liable on each basis claimed. At appeal court, they also held defenders to be vicariously liable. At Supreme Court, the decision was overturned. The court concludes that the judge and the court of appeal misunderstood the principles governing vicarious liability in a number of respects. First, the online disclosure of the data was not part of AES in his field of activities, as he was not authorised to do this act. Secondly, the satisfaction of the factors referred to by Lord Phillips could not be applied here. They held that those factors should only be considered where the wrongdoer was not an employee, and the relationship between the wrongdoer and the defendant was sufficiently akin to employment for vicarious liability to subsist. This test was not concerned with whether employees' wrongdoings were so closely connected with their employment that vicarious liability ought to be imposed. Thirdly, a temporal or causal connection alone does not satisfy the close connection test. Finally, it was highly material that AES was acting on his employer's business for purely or, or for purely personal reasons. 
In other words, he was acting on a personal vendetta. It was held that AS wrongfully disclosed the data was not so closely connected with the task that it could be fair and proper to be regarded as something that would be part of this ordinary course of employment. An employer is not normally vicariously liable where the employee was not engaged in furthering his employer's business, but rather was pursuing a personal vendetta. It was held that the close connection test was not satisfied here, and therefore Morrison's supermarket could not be held vicariously liable for the actions of AS. In summary of all that has been discussed today, it remains clear that the principle from the Lord Phillips test has been altered by the recent decisions, but it has also brought further clarity. The scope of IKS liability has gradually evolved and increased as the relationships of employment have evolved and changed over the years. It could be the case that the next change that comes as a result to fight if I case liability is because of the survivor cases that are currently litigated in court at the moment. The question that we are asking is not is whether or not organisations can be held by case of liable for the actions of the employees that have now died. This is a question that we currently don't know the answer to, as it's not a question that has been asked since time bar was removed in these cases. I am certain that by the end of this year we'll be back with a further update. But until then, I will end the seminar here. I want to take time to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to this presentation. Um, if you have any questions in relation to vicarious liability, any follow-ups or comments, please feel free to send me an email or give me a call. Along with this presentation, there will be the accompanying PowerPoint slides along with my notes for this presentation. But in the meantime, please all take care to remain safe and healthy, and hopefully we'll be back to some normality soon. But in the meantime, thank you for listening.